So yeah, NVIDIA single-handedly propping up the U.S. economy, doing a few victory laps at GTC. I guess, I guess we'll give them a pass on that. But uh, there's a lot of people at GTC and there's a lot of things happening at GTC. I'm on the show floor where the vendors are. So keep in mind, this is also a, like a learning conference and there's classes and sessions. But over here, people are showing off their products. And there are a lot of interesting products to be seen. Well, look who I ran into from Liquid, my favorite composable infrastructure company. Hey, buddy, how you doing? There's so much stuff here. Okay, so Liquid, this is really cool. You've got, what, eight L40Ss in here? How about 10? 10 L40Ss. This is part of a composable PCIe fabric solution. Correct. So that means that you can take one or two or four or eight or 12 of these and map them to physical hosts through a PCIe interconnect. Earlier in our video, we were taking a look at some super micro chassis that have 64 PCIe lanes out the back and they're like, ah, we can do InfiniBand, ah, we can do Ethernet. How about raw PCIe Gen 5? No interface, it's just PCIe. NVMe over fabric, this is how it's done. You got it, yeah. So this is an example of what we call our ultra stack. So you mentioned we do composable infrastructure. We have a simpler version, which is just essentially taking and plugging in you know, 10 or 20 GPUs into a single 2U server. This is it. As you mentioned, it's running right over raw PCIe. So you get extreme density, uh, efficiency. Instead of having to add a server for every eight GPUs, you just have one server, 10 or 20 GPUs, and in this case, we're using the NVIDIA L40S, which are readily available, and uh, just a great all-around universal GPU. And you can even use NVLink bridges with these? This one, actually, we do peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, so we can do it over native PCIe. Uh, we do native PCIe peer-to-peer -peer between all of these, so you can these can communicate with each other over PCIe between uh, the GPUs themselves and also between uh, the, the chassis. So if you look at that picture right there on the wall, that's a picture of two chassis with 20 GPUs. They, can, they actually communicate with each other uh, without with just bypassing the CPU. So, so that's, that's connected to your 2U Dell server and that's just 20 GPUs in a server. You can put it in a Kubernetes cluster and you're good to go. You got it. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a real big fan of PCIe composability, but there's no arguing with the simplicity of, let's just add a bunch of resources to a Kubernetes cluster and let Kubernetes deal with it. You got it, yeah. And like you said, I mean, you can put whatever you want in here. In this case, we have the GPUs, but you could do uh, DPUs, uh, you know, the blue fields, you can use uh, ConnectX7s in here uh, and do, you know, east-west east clustering. You can do northbound integration, everything with these. So. Um, you know, very, very flexible. And like I said, automate it all. The size of this copper bus bar is something to behold. <laughs> yeah, don't steal it. It's worth a lot of money. The street, val <laughs> the street value is quite a bit. <laughs> this looks familiar. This is, this is the, oh, this is an OG Honey Badger, isn't it? OG. So this, if you're not in the know, has eight M.2 slots and a PCIe PLX switch. So it's full 16 lanes, but you've got all the connectivity for all the M.2. This is insanely fast storage. One thing that makes this really handy on a PCIe fabric is that you can put eight M.2 on this and then put a bunch of these in a chassis like this or mix and match GPUs yep. and storage. And then you can compose this into different physical hosts or use a chassis like this and connect to a 2U system that otherwise doesn't have eight M.2 slots. Well, and to add to that, you can actually do GPU direct, uh, you know, do between storage and the GPU. So you can go between storage and GPU, GPU to GPU, and bypass the CPU altogether. So that is, in fact, we're giving one of these away at the show. Ooh, yeah. enter to win. Although, by the time you're seeing this video, it's probably <laughs> too late, I'm sorry. So it's not a trade show, it's actually a conference where you can learn. And these are academic papers. Modeling superventricular tachycardia using dynamic computer-generated left atrium. Digital twin, but in a medical capacity. And there are real breakthroughs being made Imagine doing these kinds of presentations in college and then coming to give these kinds of presentations in a trade show. It works, it works really, really well to be able to show off the cool thing that you're working on with one or a hundred A100s or H100s or whatever. I'm at GTC, right? Not the farmers conference, but AI farming is actually kind of a big deal. We've, we've seen AI do weeding to avoid using chemicals. And so that's here as well. There's AI in literally everything. So I heard they're working on a Knight Rider reboot. Self-driving cars are finally here only 40 years later. 
Well, you figure at an AI event there's going to be self-driving cars and autonomous robots and well, I wasn't exactly figuring that, but they are on display. Disney's here, the Star Wars robots from Disney that we saw on stage. Those are real and those were also trained in Omniverse. It was easier to just simulate all of reality and then train the robots over thousands of years in simulated reality and then download that to real robots and it ran basically the same. That's that's where we are with digital twins in the Omniverse and I'm learning a lot. It's really exciting. Innovation startups, yeah, that's going to power the economy. All the different applications of AI. If you're a startup company or looking to get venture capital, there's a place for that here because this isn't just a trade show. There's a lot of actual things happening here with startup companies. Show off your software, your idea, put it together on a 4090, get a demo, you could show it off here and maybe it takes off, maybe something happens. There's so many startup companies here showing off such cool stuff. Everybody is making NVIDIA hardware, literally everybody. Everybody who's anybody, I guess. I mean, that's how that works, right? And NVIDIA is really showing off all of the, uh, all of the ideas, all of the crazy, all the clever. Air cooling here, water cooling there for density. But it's not just about the GPUs, it's also about the connectivity, NVLink, and scaling out. Because the faster and the lower latency the connection is between everything, the more you can use your VRAM in a kind of additive way to let the models uh, really stretch their legs. We have chassis from everybody, literally everybody. Everybody who's anybody is building stuff. It's not just about the GPU connectivity, it's also about the interconnects and the low latency interconnects and all of the VRAM. And also potentially liquid cooling, like liquid cooling for density. Really density is what we're talking about here. That's driving a lot of the liquid cooling, but air cooling is also still an option, although increasingly the front of the rack is concerned primarily with intake, air intake. One thing's clear at GTC, NVIDIA wants to take over the universe, or more specifically, the data center part of the universe. NVIDIA sees itself as being involved in a whole bunch of different industries now because they can offer turnkey solutions to let you deploy AI within your organization. If you really want to embrace what NVIDIA is selling, they're selling you five racks at a time, DGX. And this is the hub and spoke thing that they talked about in their press release and, and their other material. This is where NVIDIA sees its growth market. Basically, they come in and they say, we've got the complete hardware and software solution. In the same way that NVIDIA provides CUDA as an abstraction layer to their hardware, NVIDIA is hoping that their DGX offerings will provide an abstraction layer to data centers. And Really, they've already got quite a head start on this. They're selling entire rack scale systems. They're dealing with the switching and networking technology. They do seem to be a couple of steps ahead here in terms of anticipating customer needs. And bringing new customers on board, NVIDIA could handle a lot of the expertise that normally an organization would have to spool up internal expertise in order to be able to deploy this. Think about Deploying a PCIe GPU. We see PCIe GPUs all around the show floor here. You're gonna need a lot of expertise to be able to use that. Meanwhile, the 72 Blackwell system that we saw from Supermicro, you can deploy that and your single instance Python application will run just as well on that as it runs on a single GPU. That's the... <laughs> That's part of NVIDIA's growth market here. It's like, ah, don't, don't worry about it, don't figure it out. We'll help you figure it out, and we will uh, benefit in the business wins of that together. Look, it's Kubernetes, it's the NVIDIA GTC demo. So much Kubernetes. The control plane to be able to manage all of this via InfiniBand. US East, H100, oh, there's a lot of H100s here. Google would like to reconnect with our humanity by printing t-shirts. Bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for him. An Apple III monitor and stand with a Model M keyboard. This is not even from the same genre. What is this, amateur hour? Although it is pretty cool that it's hooked up to an AI chatbot. I mean, I guess that's cool. So storage, Fison, I know you. I'm here. I got a preview of this product a little while ago, but you guys are ready to show it off finally. You're doing 70 billion parameter model training. There's just four GPUs in here, but you're running your storage in single level cell mode, and the GPUs talk directly to the storage, so you don't need as much VRAM? Kinda, kinda. They're not talking directly. You still gotta go through the, C through the CPU, because the CPU has to figure out which slices of the model are gonna go to the GPUs and when. It's more like a, you know, streaming. The CPU is more like a traffic cop in this case. Uh, but yeah, the idea here is we're gonna sell this as a whole solution, in this, in this case, we're working with our partner, Bangear. Pre-build system, 
It's going to have all the software loaded on it, ready to go out of the box. So this is your pizza box thing, right? Even a little bit more advanced of a pizza box because it comes with all the software load out ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, so we're using our drives in SLC mode because we need the speed. You can train large models with limited GPU resources. The trade-off, of course, is time, right? It's going to take longer to do the training. But we were looking at some of the stats here, and the GPU utilization is 100%. So oh, yeah. you're keeping the GPUs fed, even though it's pulling a lot from storage. Yeah, we're, we're keeping the GPUs fed. But again, this is not going to train as fast as one of those 42U racks full of GPUs over there, right? Well, I mean, who can afford that? Well, but the idea is that this can be sitting next to your desk you know, at a hospital, training on medical data, things that aren't allowed to leave the building, right? You can just have them all in this box, do all the fine tuning, train your model, run inference against it, run queries, do your chat against, hey, I need to know such and such about whatever, you could pull it from your own data. And the, the key here is though that you, you did this with a single box, as long as you're willing to wait the extra time to do the training, and it costs you a fraction of what one of those racks would cost, right? So it's it, it's uh, more accessibility. You know, it, it puts it in the hands of more people. It kind of democratizes the 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 use of the local AI. What about the VRAM? So like, in the in, when you're doing the model training, you know, there's not enough VRAM unless you have one of the giant rack systems. This sort of takes that away. Yeah, that's that's what our that's what our middleware is doing, right? So it. We sit on top of the PyTorch level, so any any model that you can train with PyTorch, like Llama or any of those similar ones, our software it, it has an intelligence to it that understands, hey, I have these Fizon NVMe SSDs attached. I'm able to, to, you know, I know what the what the workload that those particular drives can handle and not bottleneck, and so we're just doing that um, and keeping the GPUs fed, basically 100% pegged, you know, continuous, right? We're squeezing as much performance out of, out of them as we can. Especially since it's a limited resource here, it's only four of them, not 30 or 32 or, nice. or, or whatever. Yeah. Cool. So VRAM, VRAM limitations might be overstated, at least in some scenarios for some workloads. There's, <laughs> there's some asterisks there, but it's still interesting that storage, flash storage, can be used in this way. Yeah. You just, you just have to use it intelligently, <laughs> so you don't bottleneck the storage and and starve the GPUs of work to do. What's it called? Adaptive. Adaptive. AI adaptive. AI adaptive. Adaptive. <laughs> so this is the Earth demo that NVIDIA was showing online in their press release. It's a simulation of Earth running on their GPUs. And that really underscores that NVIDIA wants to be an end-to-end -end solution. But let's take a closer look at Earth 2.0. I'm here with Matthias from NVIDIA. And this, this is a simulation of the entire Earth down to 1.25 kilometer resolution running on 64 GPUs in the cloud. It's not running on, this one is not running on 64 GPUs. This one was run in the past on a lot more GPUs. Oh, okay. But we are able to visualize it. So what you're telling me is that Jensen's secretly a supervillain because he can monitor the entire Earth down to 1.25 kilometers? I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I mean, this is like you can pan and zoom and literally just go down to the coastline. Yeah, and this, this is just one of the scenarios that we support. And uh, you can actually, uh, this is uh, a favorite spot, right? The Canary Islands. You can actually move in and then you can look at individual cells that are one kilometer in size. And you can see clouds forming around these islands. You can see the wake uh, behind these islands. The colors that you see here, the clouds are rendered in white, and then the bluer it is, the higher the wind velocity on the surface is. Could you and I like go find a shipwreck that hasn't been found yet and and uh, get some gold? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure the simulation will actually cover that. You can spend a lot of time on it, right? You can just you can look around and you can look for interesting patterns, right? Just because you have now the chance to do that, where normally if you run a traditional simulation, you you run it on a supercomputer somewhere. Um, then you know you have these enormous files that are laying around, and maybe a couple of weeks afterwards you get some pictures of it, right? and maybe you can do some some interaction, but not to this degree, right? So now you, you can actually, if you if you say, oh that that was an interesting thing, what what just happened there, right? You can you can go back in time, you can you can play it back and forth, and you can just kind of get an idea of what's happening there, and you can spot things that you didn't even know were in the data before. Looking around and seeing the level of expertise here and the industry leaders and all of the learning and workshops and Startup Nation stuff going on, this generation of machines could be the generation of machines that gives rise to something akin to general artificial intelligence. 
at the same time, NVIDIA competitors also seeing record sales. So it's definitely an AI boom all around. And that only increases the chances we will see general artificial intelligence in the next few years. Thank you.